Hello, everybody. We are really glad you guys are here. We're going to give everybody just a minute to get into the room. I see people filtering in as I speak. We are very excited that you're joining Symmetry's webinar. So as people come into the room, um, just a couple of reminders. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A that's there at the bottom. We will try and leave time at the end for questions and answers, but if we don't get to that, if, uh, if we share too much information at the time, we will do follow-up questions as we get started. Um, as we get going, if you have any Q&A or have any questions, please let us know. And with that, um, I'm Missy Gilliland. I'm the Learning and Development Director here at Symmetry. We're very excited to have you here today for this webinar. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom. This is going to be recorded and I will be sharing um, the handout in the chat here in just a minute once everybody's in the room. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erin to get us started. Awesome. Thank you, Missy. Um, my name is Erin Masterson. I'm an associate principal here at Symmetry, and I'm joined by Jonathan Dickinson, one of our senior managers. Um, both Jonathan and I are in our consulting division, um, but our backgrounds are really heavily based in finance and revenue cycle. Um, myself, I've been in consulting for the entirety of my career, um, but I spent a lot of time in and out of agencies while Jonathan has spent most of his career with the, at the provider level and now recently in the consulting, uh, came to the dark side uh, of consulting. So when we talk today about optimizing technology to increase workflow, we're really pulling from that experience that we've been, um, we've had in our, in our past lives and our careers. Um, we're pulling from what we're seeing our, our clients doing. We're also looking at what our, our RCM division's doing, um, wh which they really serve as an extension to agencies by doing billing collection outsources. So we've, we've learned a lot in the past couple of years. Um, to say that the, the last few years have been challenging is an understatement, right? Um, the industry has gone through a lot of change. Uh, we've been challenged with expenses growing and outgrowing our revenue. So we've been forced to make changes. Um, we've been dealing with staffing shortages, moving to a remote workforce, the cost of doing business, the cost of doing care. We've had reimbursement changes. We've had cuts in reimbursement. So, you know, again, out of a fort, we had to be forced to utilize technology in a way that we, we really haven't had to use before. But I, I think a lot of what that has shown is what we can use technology for. Um, today, our goal is to really go through ways to increase and accelerate the payments for the services that your agencies are working really hard to provide. Um, they're going through their own changes. I think Medicare alone, we could list and rattle off a number of things that have, that have come with us uh, this year and, and, and moving forward. Um, but again, today, we're really looking at what what we're what we're using right now to increase our cash flow. So our agenda is going to start um, with setting agency expectations. We're going to move into tracking KPIs. So what are those KPIs that we use to measure cash flow that impact our cash flow? Mm -hmm. We'll move into identifying opportunities for automation. So what are existing technology that you're using, like your EMR or your clearinghouse or any third party vendors? Right, so how are you utilizing those throughout the revenue cycle? But we're also gonna take a look at what Symmetry and other agencies are using in the automation world, right? Taking a look at workflow automation, machine learning, robotic process automation. Um, we, we have really great relationships with a lot of these vendors, um, one of which that we, we work with a lot, Element 5. We, we were chatting the other day and they, they went through a lot of different stats and provided us one from McKinsey, basically looking at the healthcare industry and identifying that a third of what we're doing, a lot of the tasks, the mundane tasks that we're having to do are, are you know, ripe for automation. So we're gonna talk through areas that we're seeing this starting. And then we'll, we'll finish off with um, really defining that success, right? You, you put all of these uh, efforts into place are we really seeing the benefit of it within our cash collections? And then um, as Missy said, we hope we have time for Q&A. Uh, both Jonathan and I are, are, are talkers here. So our goal is to, to leave time for that. 
Um, but this is something both of us are pretty passionate about. So if we don't get to Q&A, um, please still submit those questions. We will reach out to each of you individually and make sure that we answer them. And with that, I'm gonna let Jonathan um, start us and kick us off with setting agency expectations. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. You know, the first thing you want to be able to do as an agency and coming from that agency provider role, as, as Aaron said, I spent about seven years recently in a home health hospice agency for a hospital-based system, you know, setting clear expectations for your team, understanding of where we're going, what we're focused on, and really understanding your why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And letting that team know that is so important for your organization. And it helps you set the clear expectations to communicate it across the system. So nobody's confused as to why are we trying to do new things? What are we focusing on? You know, even down to the line of how often are we going to set our meetings? You want them consistent and formatted so you can say, this is what we're trying to get out of it. You know, everybody knows the 90-10 rule of, you know, 90% of it's going to be clear and let's focus on the problems of what we really need to address. Uh, we'll talk in the next slide a little bit about don't focus on the mundane tasks that are always going on, but let's manage to the exceptions and have a real clear and defined action items of what you're going to do. We've all been in meetings where you sit there for an hour and at the end of the hour, we're right back where we started, but have real clear expectations of this is where we're starting, this is how we're gonna change things, and this is where we expect to be in the future is, is very important for you. So looking at some of those other setting agency expectations, you know, first thing that you want to look at is really eliminating some of the mundane tasks. And that really breaks down even to reporting. Um, probably most everybody pulls reports out of their EMR systems, drops them into Excel, re-reports and manipulates the same reports over and over again. How can we automate that? Where can you look in your EMR system to use it to its full advantage and say, hey, I wanna run this every week and I wanna get this information and I want it to pull it for me and distribute it to dot, dot, dot team members. Have real clear focus on what you want to look for, um, for workflows and tasks. If we know a workflow and a task, 99% of the time is just clearing out something that's already clear, we probably need to think, how can we focus on just the exceptions that are going to take place? These managing exceptions are really focused on don't look at the clean AR that you're looking through that you know is going to come in 99% of the time without even touching anything. It's a waste of um, your clerical staff's team, your AR's team's skill level to say, just continue to touch the same thing when you know it's going to be okay, but let's focus on the exception. How are we using clearing houses to report information, focus on the variances, pull uh, large batches into your clearing house to see what didn't clear out through, um, and really identify the root cause of those problems so you can fix that. And then even though it may take you a little bit longer right away, you've then fixed the long-term issue, which will help your efficiency later. Um, and focus on those trends that, that you're seeing with payers. So do you have a contract issue of lesser love of language that needs to be addressed? Do you have an EMR that isn't built accurately and your team is continually adjusting uh, balances because the contract rates aren't set up accurately in the system. Are you using your EMR for the verification and accuracies that they're seeing, or, or have there been change in plans that you need to really readjust and look at for, um, you know, getting the right payer set up right with the right patient? We all know that the new year brings on um, a whole bunch of people changing insurances, and so you have to revalidate insurances that you're going through. What will that look like? And really just even authorization, you know, is there something creating denials, increases that you can identify managing to that exception and not always just focused on, yes, this went through clear and here's the cash we collected, but how can we make it better in the long run, utilizing your team's skill set to the best of their ability, just like we do with our clinicians. And today's world, you know, the, the clerical staff, the back end billing staff, we have a limited number of team members and it doesn't just mean um, you know, pushing paper anymore or filing paperwork. We need them to be able to be efficient in everything that they're doing and using the EMRs to help them as much as possible. So with that, Aaron, I know is going to talk a little bit about some of the KPIs that we track and look through that'll help you set expectations and understand where you're moving towards. Yeah. And as Jonathan said, we don't have an abundant amount of staff anymore. Um, we have to be lean, right? Those are areas that we look for. Uh, again, I think 
everybody's a little tired of, of hearing or maybe saying we have to do more with less, but that's reality. Um, and those back offices are where um, we look at a lot of the times of where is there additional staff or maybe we could do things a little bit more efficiently. So we, we need to make, you know, those, those, those types of tasks are becoming more and more um, difficult and they're more critical to our cash flow, right? They are impacting what we're able to collect but not even that, how quickly we can even get claims out the door. So we're gonna go through that at, um, uh, in the next section. But before we get there, we wanted to go through some of those key KPIs here um, of, of how do we measure, are we being successful? What are those measures? What are we looking at um, when we really can judge how well we're doing? The first that we have here is is for for Medicare, um, and those are your days to um, admission, uh, days to notice of admission, your NOA, or notice of election, your NOE. We know that the NOA came into play full force last year. We have the phase in of the phase out of the wrap of the no pay wrap, and then the NOA. We know that the NOA and the NOE may not be generating revenue but it, it sure does impact what we're able to collect um, and how quickly we can bill and how, uh, you know, how much we can collect. And if, if we don't get these out within that five day window, that five calendar day window, we know that we're gonna then have to either file an exception or, or face the fact that we may have some bad debt there. So this is an area where are we, are we getting these out on time? And this just isn't a, a billing issue, right? There are things that need to happen in order to get these out the door. We know for the NOA, you need to have that physician order. We know that that first visit needs to be done. So we know this is impacting intake. We know this is impacting um, our, our clinical ops and team to make sure that our, vi our visits get, that first visit gets done timely. What we like to see and what we consider best practice and what, what, what we know is obtainable is two business days for that for that turnaround time. So thinking of day zero being that admission, day one being you, you know, documenting within 24 hours, if not bedside, which we know is not always uh, uh, doable with the number of nurses that you have on staff right now and the number of patients you're trying to bring on um, but within that 24-hour window and then day two is actually billing out that NOA or that NOE on the hospice side. So we we know that these are these are areas that um, again it does not generate revenue but it really does impact what we can collect. Medicare has been pretty clear about what they'll accept in, in certain areas, you know, natural disasters, um, if you're a new uh, agency, a new certified agency, if there is a issue that they deem um, is a, a MAC or CMS issue, you know, you can overturn. And they always throw that other circumstance at you. We've seen a lot of success in getting these filed. So, you know, when we look at this process, are we getting our NOAs and NOAs out the door within those two days? And for the ones that we aren't, are we tracking which, which, which one of our claims are getting hit for this? And have we attempted to file that exception? Again, it is worth it, it is worth trying because we found a lot of different areas and have had a lot of success in getting some of these overturned um, in, in the past uh, year or two here. So next, keeping on the theme of, of billing and how quickly we're getting claims out the door is days to final claims. For our home health folks, uh, we, we did a little bit of a study. Um, you know, we were looking at, okay, what are the impacts of PDGM here? We have actually seen the days um, to actually submit that final claim go down. Um, it's still not exactly where we'd like to see it, right? Our best practice is around 12 days and that's that, that means from when that claim finishes 12 days to get that claim out the door. So satisfying all of those reasons and all of those requirements to bill, which we know does change depending on certain payers. We know Medicare, we need our face-to-face, -face, we need our orders. Um, for your commercial plans, you may not need that in order to bill. So understanding those rules all in all, 12 days is normally where we like to see this because this will directly impact how quickly you're getting claims out the door. You can measure that and then how quickly you're going to get paid. If this day starts to tick up, you know you're probably going to start to see a slowdown in cash if your billing starts slowing down. It's direct direct relationship there. Um, so it, it lets us measure 
but it also lets us um, uh, be a little bit proactive in, in knowing, are we going to be short this month um, on cash? Uh, none of us have that luxury really anymore. So uh, measuring this is a good way to stay on top of it. Next and probably one of the one of the KPIs we don't see always, but one of the more important ones is your unbilled AR. Um, a high number of unbilled accounts is going to have a negative impact on cash flow. If I can't get my claims out fast enough and those start to age, not only will it slow down cash, it may now cause issues with timely filing. Uh, we have 365 days for Medicare, but some of the other Medicare Advantage plans or commercial plans, we've seen as low as 45 days, um, if not lower. So you really don't have a huge window um, for some of these other plans. So managing this unbilled AR is key. And when I say unbilled, we don't just say unbilled claims. I mean, once that claim ends, right, once you have a through date, it ages in, in the payer's eyes. They don't care if we send it out because we can't send it out because of an order. It is aged as soon as that, that through date is, is there. So we take a look at AR. We like to make sure, is this unbilled and billed AR? Our goal and best practice that we see is, is less than 10% of average monthly revenue. That's a good goal to have. Another way you can look at that is aging your unbilled, right? So if your goal is 12 days to bill, how old are the claims that you can't get out the door? Um, again, when you start to see this climb, you know you're going to have an issue with cash that month. So this is a, a pretty big one that, that we like to see. Some of the EMRs have great reports, some do not. Um, so working through how to pull this information and how to get creative in identifying this um, are ways that you know we're going to talk about on the reporting side. Um, but we do know the main reasons why we can't get claims out the door. Orders, orders is orders, face-to-face -face documentation requirements, visit documentation is one of the biggest areas. So this is definitely um, a key one to look at, and we'll be talking a little bit about this later on in in the webinar. Yeah, the only other thing, Aaron, too, with this, I want to bring to light is obviously within each EMR. AR is generated differently. If you've ever been in WellSky and they recently noted they're generating sometimes uh, what we call phantom AR, right? It's still unbilled AR, but it's for visits that never actually took place because we discharged the patient before it, but all of the processes weren't done. What kind of automation and bots can you put in to identify AR that potentially is inaccurate, which then helps your finance team as well to say, hey, our net revenue numbers are wrong and we really will never see that cash collections. And so setting that expectation early, understanding your EMR with changes that are rapidly taking place, especially for Medicare billing periods and things that are happening is, is really important to look at. Exactly. To keep on with that theme are, okay, we, we track our unbuilt AR, but do we know why our AR is, is unbuilt is growing? What impacts that? As mentioned, outstanding orders are a big one. So while the tracking of orders, some might not think that that belongs within, you know, that, that correlates with billing, it does, because if we don't have those orders back in a certain time, we're holding on to those claims. So our best practice um, is less than 10% of outstanding orders are over 30 days. Again, once those orders hit 30 days, you know it's gonna start to impact your claims. Um, so this, you know, everyone has a responsibility of, of cash flow uh, to some degree, um, and it's not just a billing issue. So understanding these and tracking these as well are really gonna be key in making sure that you've got healthy claim volumes getting out the door um, and then we'll, you know, next, obviously, is once we get our claims out the door, how quickly are we collecting on them? Um, document, uh, documented visits, again, we best practice within 24 hours, if not bedside. Um, this does play into, again, we talked about it with the NOE uh, or the NOA, um, but getting those visits in, that's normally something that we see, the approval, um, verified visits, making sure all those are verified by the time we go and hit and submit that claim so that all of our visits are on those claims. One of the things there in an agency we worked at, we really prioritize some of the value of that unbilled AR and, and utilizing your team to the best of their ability with a limited staffing model of some sorts, because 
you would rather your team driving after a, a claim that's worth $2,200 than a claim that's worth $8. Both very important, need to focus on, but if we had to, right, where's your team focused? And you can help drive that focus by keying in on these specific metrics. Exactly. So goal, obviously, how quickly we can get the claims out the door, that's going to impact cash flow. Now, once they've been billed, how quickly are we collecting on them? Air over 90 is a really common um, KPI that we, we track and trend and that we recommend tracking and trending because the longer that claim sits on the AR, the less likely it is going to be to collect. There's a reason why it didn't pay um, within the 90 days. Now we know that the we you know a lot of folks say it's adjudication. A lot of your big payers, their process. If you can get electronic billing out, they're they're turning it around in in about 30 days. Appeals may take longer, but really, if it doesn't pay in the first 30 days, right? There's normally something up with that claim. So how are we tracking those aged accounts? For Medicare, uh, we we normally have that around 10 to 15 percent. Um, for non-Medicare, 15 to 20. Medicare is lower um, because Medicare does turn around and typically, uh, we know that there's been some, some uh, uh, math processing errors um, early this year. Typically within that two week period from a clean claim being submitted, you know you're gonna get paid. We know non-Medicare, non-traditional Medicare um, might take a little bit longer. And let's face it, there are many other issues that pop up that prevent that claim from from billing so or, and from paying. So those are those are two, two um, uh, areas. Now you get into hospice, room and board, different story, right? It's a different process. That number may be more 20, 25% self-pay, same thing. Um, but if you're looking, if you're not measuring it to here now, maybe start to look at it this way and start to really track the health of your AR. So AR over 90, Next, you know, a side by side is, is your DSO, your day sales outstanding. And how long are your claims sitting on your AR? Again, the longer they sit there, the less likely they will be collected. This one's key because we measure in days. So aging from the through date is, is where we get these best practice. There are some uh, EMRs out there. I know some big ones, home care, home base, we know of age differently than from through date. You can con you know, 100% get these, this data in the system by using the through date, but depending on how you're running your reports, this is a big one. If you're running through the through date, Medicare is going to be around 30 or 45 days. That means from the day that you, uh, that claim ended, factoring in, you're probably billing within 10 to 12 days, it should be turning around and paying in another, you know, 14 days on top of that. That's kind of where we get that 30 to 45 days. If you're aging that based off the from date, obviously that date for, date range is going to be a little bit higher. Same thing with non-Medicare. We keep that around 70 days. Um, that includes all payers that aren't traditional Medicare, which would include Medicare Advantage. They do take longer. There's more things that pop up. There's other requirements such as that authorization, um, more frequent eligibility changes, um, especially in the managed Medicaid world. So these are big ones that, that we, we definitely suggest recommending because all of these, if you have in place, are going, if you start to you know, utilize your technology, you start to put all, the, all this effort into using your EMR better, using your clearinghouse, look at potential automation. How am I measuring? Is it actually successful? These are areas in which you can really take a look at um, to, to measure that success. Bad debt, best practice for Medicare is about half a percent. Non-Medicare, one and a half to two percent. Again, depending on that payer mix. Um, and then non-Medicare uh, arena, that may be lower or may be higher, but that's where we really see best practice. Um, there always is a cost of doing business. We know that ideally it's 0% is bad debt, um, but this is the you know, best practice range of what we see. And what's really good at based off this, uh, knowing where you are projected for your bad debt, you can then start to base cash goals off of that, right? So if I know that my goal is to collect 99.5% of all my Medicare, I can start to build goals out there for us to really measure, are we hitting them? Or are we not hitting them? Um, we say data, data, data is great. Measuring it is awesome. And then what you do with that next is, is really gonna be a key, but you gotta know where you stand first. 
Yeah, and that's so so important. I know we overlook it a little bit, but that cash goal is so key. Even at Symmetry, when we work with agencies, we set clear expectations for the agency to understand we're going to collect 100% of prior months Medicare and then a percentage of AR trending over certain dates and wanting that number to be clear so you can really set cash expectations for your agency and then not be surprised or just sitting there saying, well, I hope we collect cash this month because we need it in the door, but have a really clear goal on what that should be. And the last one here um, before I hand it over to Jonathan is, is, is cash posting. And this is the new kind of KPI that we've been working on. Um, you know, it's not one that's normally always discussed. And I think a lot of times we forget about cash posting, especially when we're staffing. Um, how you're how you're posting, how you're getting those those remittance advices are really going to impact how how many, how many staff members you need to actually do this and do it well. Um, so we we've been looking at percentage of ERAs best practice um, going off of our clients and what we're looking at seventy five or seventy percent of all remittance advices should be our goal should be 75 70 percent or higher should be electronic remittance advices so they should be coming in in a file that you're able to upload um M medicare hands down we know there's a most major payers are there there's some some smaller ones that you're still gonna unfortunately um, not get an era for but most of them should and your clearing houses out there um are really good at working with you your abilities your way stars e solutions they're hands down great at working at, with you and helping you get enrolled if you're not. Then there's the days to post. So we're getting our uh, uh, remittance advices, we're getting them in, now we're posting them into our into our uh, EMR. Best practice is about 48 hours, right? Two business days. So uh, we're not saying weekends, just two business days. Um, but that two business days is really going to be dependent on that percentage of ERAs, right? So if you're having to manually post majority of your accounts, you may not be hitting, uh, depending on your volume, the two business days. So that's a big one. And this is, you know, you may be getting the cash in the door, but if it's not reflective in your EMR, um, that's gonna cause issues, right? We know that that, that reconciliation process um, is so important and it is, once you let it go for too long, it becomes a nightmare to try and catch up with. So keeping good tabs on this and making sure that you're being as efficient as possible here with electronic remittance advices. We're gonna talk about a little bit about some automation that we're seeing, which is really awesome and really cool to see. Utilizing your EMRs to auto post as much as you can um, are gonna be really big in this and making sure that your AR is accurate um, and that you're making sure that you're really truly representing how quickly you are getting cash in the door. Yeah, and the next steps to this really are, you know, where exactly is your cash coming from? And that was something we look at from Symmetry is, is what's your payer mix? There's, there's simplistically three different types, right? You have traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and then fee for service. And within the Medicare Advantage, you're gonna have a PDGM contract and you're gonna have a fee for service option. The penetration that Medicare Advantage has had over the last couple of years and expected to just really, really get larger and larger in the next couple of years is huge, right? 48% of the population are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans as of 2022. And, and really, you know, home health agencies specifically, on average, 26% of the revenue is coming from that, as well as 28% of your clinical visits that you're doing to work those claims and do those patients. So you know, a quarter of your revenue is, is right now probably coming from Medicare Advantage, if not more, as the years go on. Now, we project that number to grow up. It's going to probably grow to 30, 40, 50 percent eventually down the road. And, you know, some of the things we think of for Symmetry is, you know, how are you identifying where that is? Symmetry has a, a map tool that really kind of clearly says, OK, hey, here's where the referrals are coming from in the agency. Here's where the money is in the counties that you're seeing. Here's the different plans that are there. And all that impacts your cash collections. It impacts your rates. It impacts what you need to do on the back end to be able to do it. What you used to be able to do very easily with Medicare, you now have to bring someone in to do authorization. You now have to do reauthorization. You now have different document requirements that are going to be coming in. You now have to update contracts every so often, whenever your years are built. 
Um, and again, as Aaron showed earlier, that delays some of your cash cycle. Um, you know, we see that, you know, the total Medicare Advantage enrollment in 2022, I think, was about 28.4 million, um, with predominantly about 28% being United Healthcare, and then lowering down Humana and Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. But there is a large amount of patients out there that are converting to Medicare Advantage, and you need to be able to identify those and make adjustments to your, to your processes and automate as much as you can to, to clearly see where that's coming from. Yeah, and we, there's a lot. I mean, I think this is probably one of the hottest topics right now in the industry, um, the whole Medicare Advantage um, expansion and the penetration that we're seeing. Um, there's a lot of education coming out over it. Um, you know, put a nice little plug in for, for NOC. We've, we've got a quite a webinar series coming up on this as well. Uh, we are glad partners of it. This is this is going to be a big one. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about cash flow specifically on here, um, but how to work with those plans. So, you know, stay tuned more to come on that. Um, but we, we, we felt like we couldn't at least talk about this a, a, a little bit in this presentation, because when we think about back office and where to automate, those areas of insurance authorization are big ones, and they're the ones that we're seeing trended and getting a lot more focus on when it comes to automation. Yeah, and, and part of that automation process really begins with understanding your payer setup. You know, the automation should be driving to understand where faults might exist. Is your EMR set up to bill the right 30-day billing periods for Medicare PDGM? Are you generating phantom AR that shouldn't exist? You know, the adjustments that you're seeing should be automated as much as possible to understand what's taking place. And if your EMR is set up accurately for your payers, then you know there should be very little adjustments. And so those adjustments that are taking place, your team can focus on and say, oh, this isn't working right. I'm continually getting the same adjustment amount for Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have something built inaccurately which is causing delays in our processes. Um, is your EMR looking at lupas? Is it, is it accurately anticipating if we were supposed to do four visits and we only did three, it's gonna take out what revenue is necessary and, and regenerate your net revenue for you. So when you get cash paid, that's accurate for you. Um, fee for services, how are you built? I know um, if you're using Epic, you can build it different ways of when you're going to contractually down or up your uh, your payment adjustments, or if you're using WellSky, is it happening at the time of claim? Is it happening at the time of service? When are your adjustments taking place? When is your contractual allowances taking place? All affect your financial outcomes for each month that you're processing through. And then obviously Medicare Advantage plans the same way. How are you built? What is key? Um, you know, do you know where to go change processes to make the efficiency? and your automation work to the best of its ability. And, and this is a, a very high level slide, but there's so many different systems that we work with at Symmetry, Epic, uh, you know, WellSky, Home Care Home Base, Matrix Care, CanTime, a lot of the systems, all of them are built differently and need different interactions. And so understanding that is, is very key so you can make sure you're um, generating your financials accurately. Yeah, you, the payer setup is a big one. When was the last time you audited that? It's one that's one of the first things that we we notice right away and we look at whether it's our RCM division or our, our consulting division because the payer setups do differ, but it's very important to make sure those are right because we talk about wasting time, wasting time doing a, a manual adjustments, wasting time on tracking AR that shouldn't be there or maybe was generated because we don't have the setups correctly or wasting time tracking on bill claims when maybe they're being held for a reason that they shouldn't be being held for. Conversely, you're billing with maybe an edit that's not in place that should be in place. So that payer setup not just drives a lot within RevCycle, but it may be driving other rules up front, right? What's gonna require an OASIS up front? Is that being submitted on time? Is that part of that workflow? Is that in that work queue? So the payer setup, we don't wanna underestimate how important this is not just to make sure we've got our revenue right, but it drives so many other functions within the EMRs. 
And with that, we'll jump into identifying opportunities for automation. So we, we started to talk about the rev cycle uh, different ways. We talked about intake. We're, we're talking about insurance off, which is a big one. Um, we'll, we'll briefly touch on, on scheduling, um, you know, the OASIS and documentation um, management, get into billing collections and reporting. Um, and, and we're going to look at different ways that we're seeing technology being used. So again, what's existing? What do you have right now that you can use and use more efficiently, right? Your EMR. So what do we have? What are, what are those payer setups look like? What workflows do we have? Do we have certain work queues set up um, correctly? How are you using any third party systems that are integrating within that EMR? A clearinghouse is another big one. Um, a clearinghouse is not just for claims anymore, right? You can set up your electronic mit, uh, remittance advices. You can do insurance and authorization. You can use it for denial management. There's so much out there that you can use with the existing technology, technology that you have that can reduce manual mundane tasks, as Jonathan was saying. Um, again, we only have so many back office folks um, and the clicks and the tasks seem to be growing every year with all the new requirements, especially as your payer mix starts to change. Um, and then we've got automation. So this is fun. Um, we, we are definitely learning so much more about this um, and what the capabilities are. Um, you've probably, there's automation probably already occurring in your Mars and you're you know, not as you know, much thinking about it um, as, you know, as you should, but the, one thing, you know, if you have an EMR where you bill a claim and there's a process in the background running and it's pulling that EDI file and submitting it to um, a clearinghouse, that's one less step that your staff has to take, right? That is part of automation. So it's applying that concept to other things that you're doing, right? We've got machine learning, um, which really allows those bots um, and it really takes AI and it's, it's learning how to recognize the patterns that you're already doing using robotic process automation. Um, RPA that you're going to hear is integrating those bots and again mimicking human interaction so it's really taking a look at what we have existing and what could we use it for right sweeping a file and uploading a claim batch is less complex right you're you're teaching that to run a job every day versus saying hey read this task for a need for authorization understand what needs to be required go into this payer portal submit it and then pull the response back a little bit more complex right so there's different varying ways you can be using automation and it really depends on what your organization is really ready for how much you're willing to invest um, and, and really how to best utilize your staff. Now, there's a lot of great cost savings that can replace certain tasks, but it does have to be managed. So it, this isn't the, okay, we can implement it and then step away and we never have to look at it. It does have to be managed. Not all tasks are successful as others to automate. Um, so there's, there's going to be issues, right? There are things that are gonna pop up if a file is too big, whether it's a human doing it or the bot doing it, that needs to be managed, it's gonna kick out, right? So there are things that still need to be managed. And right now we're seeing a ton of agencies trialing these processes. Um, we're also working on our internal processes at Symmetry um, within our own RCM division. And we're really excited to kind of share some of those opportunities that we're seeing and options that we, uh, agencies are not only using their EMRs or clearing houses and third parties, but ways they're thinking about using automation. And with that, I'll let Jonathan kind of kick us off with some intake insurance verification pieces, and then we'll dive in through the rest of the rev cycle. Yeah, and, and sadly, I get way too excited about uh, the upfront process of, of home health and so or hospice, either one, you know, really, I spent a lot of my career in, in intake process and, and operations. And so, you know, looking at intake processes alone, you know, understanding what your referral acceptance system is. Are you utilizing your EMR for the process that you should be going through? Are they, is your EMR integrated with um, different referral systems, ECIN, Allscripts, Navi Health, different places that you should be auto pulling in documentation, auto pulling in information, and how much of it can even be auto filled depending on the, the referral source that you're working with? Are they on the same EMR? Can you track and pull the same information that'll get filled in? 
and shorten the time and work that your intake system is trying to do. Can you get documentation uploaded and pulled in? You know you need a face-to-face. -face. You know you need discharge information. You know you need orders. How much of that can be automated to come in so your team isn't requesting it through a fax or, or getting it printed out and then uploading it into your EMR system? Or heaven forbid, you're still keeping you know manual file paperwork um, and filing that paperwork away. So looking for ways that you can automate that to come in and upload to the right location, which really then drives into your insurance verification, which your intake team is most likely handling as well. And we know that when open enrollment comes in, you're gonna see a whole bunch of denials. You're gonna see different pieces, people changing insurances. So is your EMR processing electronic verification? Majority of EMRs have this automated process, especially for Medicare. Are you utilizing that? And how often are you utilizing it? Is it sending off the 270 to request the information and then getting back a 271 for if your, your patient is eligible and the benefits that are coming in with those verifications? That should be automated 100% for what you're looking at. Um, and if it's not, you know, you're spending a lot of time to do it. Medicare for the agency we worked at, we did it every 30 days. The system just automatically processed it for us and it worked through the system. The other piece that you're looking at is just um, looking for anything that the clearinghouse can do for you, right? If you're not doing it on your EMR, what can your clearinghouse do? Does that automation exist? If not for all payers, at least what payers can be done, um, verifying patient name, date of birth, et cetera, and really just completing that batch eligibility that you can upload to your clearinghouse, pull a batch worth of patients, upload it in, make sure that they verify, yes, this information is still accurate or no, this patient has changed. Um, I think we could all be probably millionaires if we would determine and find a best practice for payer source change in the industry, yeah. but that's always something that's a problem, right? There's no simple way in any EMR that I've ever seen that's a payer source change process. Symmetry has built a lot of manual processes to understand these and make sure we have it very, very clear documented, but that is what you want your team working on, not, you know, well, there's a payer change. We hope we get it fixed. But now we know exactly what to do exactly when we identify or our automation identified this patient changed payers as of this date. What do we need to do? Let's start working through it clearly and specifically. Yeah, and, and on the automation front, we're seeing a lot of really cool things. If your EMR is creating alerts or tasks um, to work what the automation can do is look for that specific alert, escalate and run, run the verification for you, and then really escalate those that need to be worked, really working to the exceptions, and then clearing out um, alerts that are clean. Think of all of those tasks that you have to click through. This is kind of helping automate that process. So your team is working. We always talk about clinicians working to the top of their license. Let's have our, let's treat our back office staff the same way, right? We say back office, we say clerical. This is not pushing paper anymore. This is understanding issues, troubleshooting, managing those exceptions and, and doing them quickly. To Jonathan's point, pair changes are a pain point everywhere. Um, it is just, it's, it, no one wants to deal with them when they happen. They sure as heck don't want to deal with them if it's 30, 45 days later. So if we can eliminate that as much as possible, we'll, we'll be very happy. We won't be writing anything off, but we'll definitely be making some friends um, upstream, whoever in ops has to deal with a lot of those pair changes, OASIS changes. Yeah, and, and as we talked earlier, right, the, the pair change mix that's coming down and, and that we've seen already in the industry really notates that that authorization is going to be a big piece. Ensuring a clear authorization workflow is set up is, is we can't understate the importance of it, right? Whether you're in Epic and you're using work queues or you're in WellSky and you're using their authorization manager process, make sure your team is working at least within the EMR system and tracking it within that system. You know, there, there's portal access requests that you should be utilizing. Not everything should be faxed. As much as you can do electronically is, is first and foremost the most important thing in keeping it in your EMR system. And then there's there's also pieces that, you know, there's simple tasks for automating some of these authorizations to say, sending a bot in to sweep a payer portal and see if, 
if authorizations have been approved or not. Teaching your system to do that and understanding what is available. There's more complex, um, you know, automated features where you can teach the bot to go in, depending on the payer, understand exactly what authorization is necessary, look in your EMR, find what documents it needs, and auto upload that documents in a timely manner so it can be done and see that, hey, this authorization is there. And like Aaron mentioned earlier, we still have to manage that. You still have to oversee that process to make sure things are flowing smoothly. But those automations exist out there in today's world, and they're available with a lot of different ways to look at it. But, you know, we, again, look to say, take a look and see what's available for you to be able to do in your specific EMR. If nothing else, make sure your EMR is being utilized to the fullest of its capability, whether you need to do a review of that. Um, but if I came across an agency one time and, you know, they used, um, you know, one notes to track all their authorizations. Well, that's not very efficient for anybody who wants to see if an authorization is approved because only one person had access to it. So track your teams, understanding what's taking place, utilizing the payer portals for you can uh, see when and where and have that reported out. Your EMR is going to report it if you have it in there. And then that standard follow-up process really needs to be documented for you to understand. My team now needs to do this. And I have it very clearly when and where they should do it. The scheduling piece as well, again, is important for you to be able to automate as much as possible to understand, you know, when should things take place? You know, when do we have visits that need to take place? Or are we doing visits outside of an authorization? And how quickly are we identifying that to the clinical staff to say, hey, we don't have authorization for this. These are freebies until we get authorization. Um, in the world and in, in healthcare, obviously patients come first, which we'll talk about with identifying our success, but how do we get that information across to the organization? How are we clearly and quickly identifying it so we don't have losses in the financial area? And continuing on with that theme, um, OASIS submission. So while completing the OASIS and the Q QA of OASIS really occurs in operations and really quality, the timeliness of that is so important because we only have so many days to get that out and submitted for home health. Um, and if that's not done in a certain period of time, we know that that claim will get hit and it will deny for no OASIS, no matching OASIS. Those are very hard to overturn if there is no proof of that being submitted on time. So, you know, we, we look at that and the importance of it. There are, again, we're starting to see automation of file transfers, right? Um, your OASIS is being created and it, whether, depending on what EMR, there is a status that it's in, OASIS that need to be tra transmitted. What the automation will do is it will do a file transfer. It will set that bot to pull the OASIS, send it to IT's and then pull back the response. Um, with automation, we avoid forgetting, oops, didn't do that today or someone's out and we forgot to transmit that, that file. This does that for you. Um, but again, still needs to be managed, but it's, it's a few less clicks that that one person has to be doing. Um, the documentation uh, management, well, first, you know, obviously plan of care, if, if we can standardize that process, streamline your orders process, that first is very, very helpful. Then when it gets to our back office staff who actually have to submit it, we've got, uh, there's utilization um, within EMRs to manage orders. There's also third-party documentation tracking platforms that also aid in um, being that hub for those orders. Worldview, we've got Fakura, they're out there. They integrate with a lot of different systems um, where they pull the orders, barcode them, you can auto fax them out, send them. And instead of having someone sit there and manually faxing that out every day, you can set it up to run, pull, auto fax. You still have to set clear guidelines of your escalation process of when you're when you're touching those orders, when you're calling, right? If, if an order didn't get signed in seven days and you just keep auto faxing, most likely there's something wrong with it. You still have to call. There's still going to need to be a human interaction there. That does not go away, but it does reduce the amount of touches that that person has to take. And when we think about the staffing of orders, that can grow very quickly. And we do not want that outstanding orders uh, log to grow because that's going to impact what I can bill. Um, and then we will not get paid as, as timely or at all if we get past that timely filing. 
Another thing that I threw on here last minute, so sorry if uh, the slides we have uploaded is review choice demonstration for those for those uh, in lucky states who are, are kind of going through this, we've seen automation with the clearing houses um, and automation vendors, right? So we're between the clearing house and Palmetto. We've also seen third party automation vendors where they are utilizing the EHR, they're pulling the documentation, sending it off to Palmetto, waiting for that response, pulling that back in with the UTIN and putting into your system. So that's all bringing it back. We know that there's a ton of EMRs out there that have this set up, Cantime, WellSky, Home Care Home Base. Um, you have this platform out there, it's available. Now, obviously you'd be working with an automation vendor. So there's additional cost there, but think about all the time and energy that takes. Is there an ROI there for you? Um, in some in many instances, yes, um, and it's less time that I have to have someone doing that mundane task, and we can train a bot to do that. Um, going into um, you know the supply drug DME management, um, most agencies are doing some type of form of drop shipment. If not, it's definitely something that we would we would recommend. Um, it's a way to reduce the back and forth for your clinicians going to the office, picking up supplies. Clinicians, we need to be utilizing them as best we can and seeing our patients and not driving back and forth to offices for supplies that are unnecessary, right? So that's an area that, you know, is, is, is out there. That's, I don't think, a new concept for a lot of us. But also the automated reorder, um, the formularies that you're using so that you're ordering the recommended um, uh, supplies, drugs, um, so forth with your patients mm -hmm. out there. A lot of opportunities in these arenas, um, as well as, you know, going into billing and collections. And this is really cool. I mean, really cool for, it may not be for everybody, but uh, really trying to see how you can use um, different ways to do billing, your denial management, and cash posting. From a billing standpoint, you know, automating billing batches, right? Uh, this is something that you go in, billing needs to be done frequently, right? We want to keep up cash flow, we need to bill frequently. Um, so you can do that within your EMRs, or you could set bots to do that. Um, the utilization of a clearinghouse to submit those claims and to pull in and read those, those claim acknowledgement reports are huge. Um, you make that mistake once, you don't ever do it again, right? I got all my claims filled, but didn't check to make sure they actually got accepted. Um, it, then all of a sudden you're not seeing any payments in two, three weeks, and there's a reason why they're not on file. Uh, so utilizing your uh, technology there, um, instead of having to call every single claim, call the ones that you know are, are, are actually on file and the ones that actually need to be touched. And that's, you know, as we get into the AR review and denial follow-up here, um, develop and create automated breakdown of key uh, AR statistics, right? So when we're identifying what our, our count reps are, are actually following up our, on, let's make sure it's an active AR that has an issue. If it's not an active AR because we haven't cash posted it timely, we don't want to waste their time. If it's an AR issue that we know is going to process and pay, we don't want to waste their time. We want them to be following up on the ones that actually need to be touched. And your technology can help you do that. So your EMR, you can run your reports, right? You can run your reports of seeing what's active. And that's only if you're really cash posting well. You can utilize your clearinghouse to identify those claims that have been denied have been rejected for Medicare, have been sent to RTP. So instead of following up on the 100 that you build, follow up on the 10 that we know aren't hitting a good processing status. Automation's another cool one that's come in where they're running reports from the EMR. Um, we're utilizing this actually in our RCM division. We all work in certain EMRs or you might have in the past where reporting um, is a little clunky um, and the way the reports export aren't very... Uh, usable. Um, not everybody has the sophistication of a, a great BI tool or even have the, the team who can even understand how to work that. So we're using bots to go in, pull these reports, and then we teach it how we cut it, right? So if we're cut slicing and dicing this file, think of it as if you know what a macro is, you can run that. The bot will do that and give us the information that we need and really aggregate that data for us. 
that's a really great way to be using this kind of automation as well as denial management. Um, you can set up bots that will go out into the payer portal, pull back an actual response of where that claim is sitting in the adjudication process, even to the point where it can write a billing note for you into your system. There's a lot of different ways you can utilize bots, but again, there's the management and oversight of it. Don't just set it up, trust it, and never look at it again. You have to run those KPIs. You have to be managing, is what we've put in place working and worth the investment? On the cash posting side, um, automate that process as much as possible with ERAs. That auto adjustment guideline, we do not want our team sitting there adjusting penny, pennies on the account. We don't want them adjusting contractual allowances when that should be auto adjusting for us. Um, we've seen automation with being able to help us with pulling reporting and reconciliation. We don't have a good reconciliation process. Month end close can be a nightmare. And then now we're not only utilizing a lot of staff at the end of the month, we have now made our finance departments very angry uh, because they can't close properly. Um, so there's ways to be utilizing automation for cash posting. But automation is, is not that you have to invest always in a bot. It's how are you using what you already pay for and what you already have that's in existence. Jonathan's going to kind of go into the reporting piece here and kind of close us out. But that's another area where agencies can spend a lot of time because these reports can come out or there's just so many reports to choose from. So he's going to kind of take us through reporting in that payer setup and then we'll kind of close out with defining that success. Yeah, and this all works together because understanding that everything we're doing flows down to reporting for what we need to be able to identify as key and important and really looking at it, automating as many reports as you can, whether that be financial and you're looking at the AR, the cash, the adjustments or, or financial revenue numbers, or whether you're looking at operational procedures from outstanding orders, authorizations that are outstanding and pending, denials, uh, visit utilization that you're looking at. As Aaron mentioned, teaching your system what you want it to look for so it is automating that data. Even if you're using a dashboard and saying, okay, well, I need to pull this report and, and plug it in somewhere. How do I teach it to do it on itself? So I'm getting the data that I need. Um, one thing we always see at Symmetry too is, is over data can sometimes be a problem if you're looking at a hundred things when you really need to focus on key 10 statistics that you want to do to move your organization in the right way that you, you need to go and understanding what your EMR can do. My EMR can do this. Not every EMR is built uh, the same. Some are limited, some are not. And if you need something, how do we get it? How do we teach a bot to come in, like Aaron mentioned, pull what I need and develop it so it does it automatically for me? And I'm not spending an hour, two hours, three hours a week developing it, developing it for myself and changing it. EMRs are also always changing. Are you updated with what needs to be there, right? Are you, do you have the most recent information? Are you on their, their webinars, their changes that are taking place? Because uh, WellSky, Home Care Home Base, Epic, Canti, Matrix Care, they're always changing different stuff. Even adding a line or a, or a column in can affect things down the road that you need to make sure you're tracking and understanding what's taking place in your EMR or if they've changed the methodology of how their reporting takes place. Um, you know, those payer setups we talked about earlier are important to understand what rates are in there and how are they done. When was the last time you looked at your payer setups, really digging in and saying every payer we want to go through and make sure they're built as we know the contracts are there. So when we have a problem, we can clearly say we know our system is accurate. And now the, our team members can go dig in for, hey, this is wrong. We need to get paid differently and bring in and increase that cash collections. So. I know we're almost out of time. We'll run through the defining success real quick and then kind of um, wrap it up. Yeah, so quickly, we, we need to, again, define uh, here uh, what, what's obtainable, what are our timelines, is what we're doing actually working? Is the time and energy and resources of what we're putting into it worth it? Where is there opportunity to be able to find that automation with existing technology and what may be worth looking at in a little bit more detail? and then really putting into place and using those KPIs that we talked about, ultimately your cash collections, creating those goals based off best bad, bad debt practice is gonna help you see whether you've been successful, is that trending in the right way? Are you reducing your AR? 
Um, are you creating claims faster? Is the DSO decreasing? Do we have, uh, you know, do we have any overflow or, or any uh, flex within our, our billing team now, or maybe our back office team? Kind of taking a look at that and how to really redeploy them elsewhere um, is, is a great way to start. And I'll let uh, Jonathan kind of take credit here for, for perks uh, uh, and do that. This is just because I'm, I'm weird in nature and, and I want things to kind of tie across. And I always used to teach my team, like, think about perks, right? What is what is happening? And if our success doesn't hit one of these measures, then we're probably doing something that isn't impacting our organization. If we're not impacting patient quality, reducing expense, increasing revenue, can we measure it with a KPI? Can we see where we started and where we ended? Or are we creating some sort of synergy across our system we're probably just doing work just to do work and we haven't made an impact on what we want. And so I always used to drive our teams to say, we want to focus on one of these things. What is the perks of where we're trying to go? And does it fit within these roles? Then we know we can be successful. So I don't know if we have time for Q&A, Missy. I know we're, we're at the hour, but um, you know we would be happy as always to, to follow up with answers as much as we can. I think our contact information is, is down at the end of this as well. But I'll let Aaron wrap us up. Yeah, um, like we we can tell we're very passionate about this and I'm sure there's some Q&A. Missy, anything that we have, I think I see a couple out there. Uh, we have who submitted it. We should be able to respond to you personally. And then um, our updated uh, contact information is right here for you. Definitely. And there weren't many questions that I wasn't able to answer. So I think we're in good shape. So thank you all for joining us today. As always, if you have questions, please reach out. We are available to assist you in whatever way we can. Uh, thank you and have a great Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.